And our last speaker prior to the dinner is someone that I've known for many, many years, decades. She was in my class, and as I just told her guest, well, a few years, okay? Maybe three years, okay. When she was in my class, I would say, here's the syllabus, and she would say to me, Dr. Payne, we need to change the syllabus. This is what we need to do. And one day she said to me, I'm not going to be in class next week. She was a White House intern because I'm going to China with the First Lady because women's rights are human rights. And so this is the type of person who has a spirit, a change agent, who's constantly impressing me. She's got a whole group of advocates. She just came back from Arizona on another project. And she's going to be in a conversation because as we've said, these are all about Emerson dialogues in which we don't have a lot of lights. We don't have a lot of PowerPoints. It's the old art of public speaking, which is more relevant today than ever. So without me saying any more, I would like to turn it over to one of my favorite students, a change advocate who's gonna make the world a better place, Elise. Perfect. Hi, everyone. Well, I, I can never turn Emerson down because I feel as though I continually have to pay back and pay forward all of what the community and the school gave to me, and particularly Dr. Payne, who I definitely can't say no to, you know, and he knows that. <laughs> Um, I'm so thrilled to be here, so um, just to give a little background um, on my organization, Vital Voices. Um, so I'm Elise Nelson, President and CEO of Vital Voices. We search the world for women who have a daring vision for change, um, who are taking on some of the world's greatest challenges, and we invest in these leaders to take their vision to scale, and we do that through training, mentoring, and network of their peers, visibility, credibility, funding, all the critical things that we believe um, women need and all leaders, quite frankly, need um, to succeed. We also make long-term investments um, in these leaders. And to date, we've invested in 20,000 women leaders across 184 countries that have impacted the lives of over 100 million people. Um, and so that's how we see that ripple, uh, ripple effect and change. Um, I am so thrilled to be here with one of these extraordinary change agents to um, be in discussion. I really wanted to bring this woman, Pumzili Van Dam, to introduce her into the Emerson community. She was one of the, the youngest one woman, yeah, one of the youngest uh, members of, of the South Africans Parliament, um, and named one of the most incredible, you know, Forbes. I think it was what twenty under thirty uh, leaders. She is also one of the world's leading disinformation experts. And I know we all know a thing or two about disinformation and misinformation, and the need for greater ethics um, in tech. Uh, and so we're going to get into a discussion about all of that. I was so excited to bring her here because you will hear in her story, this is a woman who eats snow for breakfast, just like another woman who lives just up the street from here, our vice president. Um, before we get into our discussion, I just want to say that um, as many of you I'm sure have seen in the headlines, uh, you don't have to look very far to see women-led change and the power of it. And that's, I know, what this discussion is about. Uh, for the last couple weeks, Vital Voices has been running a campaign to support Iranian women and to remove um, Iran from the Commission on the Status of Women at the United Nations. We published last Sunday a huge center spread in the New York Times um, with some of the most admired women leaders who immediately signed on, which I have to say was incredible, from Oprah to Hillary Clinton to Michelle Obama to Laura Bush to, um, I mean, so many extraordinary women around the world, Jacinda Ardern, uh, the head of New Zealand, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister in Canada, Grasha Michelle, a legend in South Africa. Um, really, you know her well, I'm sure. <laughs> Um, so just an extraordinary group of women, and they signed on to this letter. It was published, and then guess what? Three days later, just this past Wednesday, two days ago, the Vice President of the United States announced the U.S. government's intention to work with other governments to remove Iran from the Commission on Status of Women. So here's the thing. That has never happened before. 
okay? And, you know, I know that male leaders do a lot of great things, of course, but there is something different and something, quite frankly, that's needed in women's leadership. And one of the things that I have found so inspiring working with women leaders over the last 25 years is that they find networks of each other, they use their power to empower, they understand the only meaningful measure of power is the extent of its positive impact. And that is certainly what, what this woman is all about. Um, Pumzile, because you are in a very historic place, we are here at the Watergate, and everyone knows about what happened in the Watergate, and uh, powerful people that were taken down um, because of what happened here. And you have your own story um, of how you took down some very powerful players who were not playing nice and yeah. created a huge amount of um, hate and disinformation in your country. And at the time, you were a member of parliament I would love for you to tell everyone that story. Sure. Um, is this on? Um, thank you so much. It's so lovely to be here. Um, and I think being in this historic building and being in an historic time, I think, in the United States, so it's really great to be here. Um, so my story of slaying a giant. Um, I'm sure, I, I think everyone's kind of from the communications and PR industry. I'm sure you all know Bell Pottinger, the firm formerly known as Bell Pottinger. For those who don't know, it was a UK-based global PR firm. They had clients such as the Pentagon. Um, they did a campaign in Iran for the Pentagon, um, a disinformation campaign around weapons of mass destruction. They had Augusto Pinochet as a client. Um, they were called Margaret Thatcher's favorite PR company. They ran her kind of her election campaigns. So what Bell Pottinger did, they got a contract in South Africa with a family called the Guptas. So they were a family that had close links to the then president of South Africa, Jacob Zuma, and they kind of hired Bell Pottinger to polish the image. Um, and they ran a campaign in South Africa, a country with a history of, of apartheid, where they sought to kind of pit South Africa's different racial groups against each other. Um, and the effect of that in a country that has, you know, 25 years is not a long time in history. We should just emerge from, a, from apartheid where race relations are a tinderbox. You know, it just takes for something really small to ignite what a racial tension. So Bell Pottinger came, they ran this campaign where they introduced terms such as white monopoly capital, which sort of tried to blame all of South Africa's problems on white people um, to kind of remove the attention from the new democratic government in South Africa. You know, while apartheid could have kind of been responsible for the problems South Africa found itself in, but also the new government, you know, held some of the problems with not dealing with corruption, not dealing with race relations. Um, so there was a big leak a Watergate, a leak of all the documents related to Bell Pottinger. Um, to this day, we still don't know who the source of those documents was. <laughs> um, and so there was a whole treasure trove of documents released, which basically gave the full breakdown of Bell Pottinger's PR campaign. Um, and what that resulted in in South Africa was a rare moment of unity where South Africans of all different cultures, different races, stood together and said, we're not going to have a PR company from outside of South Africa to come and divide us. Um, you know, South Africa doesn't have very many moments of unity. I think the last one was the World Cup in 2010. So this was like a really seminal moment where South Africans would put the differences aside and said, we're not going to be divided. Um, and there was kind of new channels for activism, which is what social media was. Uh, so it was a channel for activism where South Africans got together, um, you know, they really kind of engaged in a lot of digital activism against Bob Pottinger. They shut down their, their social media accounts. I think that's rule number one in the PR industry, don't become the news. So they became the news. So I was a member of parliament then, and I sort of tried to find ways to hold Bob Pottinger accountable. 
Um, and then I wrote a letter to the UK's PR industry body. I wrote it and I was like, mm, yeah, I don't know, probably never going to respond, you know, some African MP, you know, whatever. And they responded. Um, and I went to London, presented our case. I always say I felt like an Olympic athlete representing my country without any of the Olympic talent. Um, <laughs> But I went probably there. Probably all the support <laughs> <Yeah>. the Olympics. <laughs> yeah. Olympians. And I, yeah, and I sat there in front of kind of the big wigs of the UK PR industry, presented our case. Um, we won, uh, and Bill Pottinger, all their clients left, and they shot shop two weeks later. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, oh yeah, and the story of, of Bob Pottinger, there's a documentary about it called Influence. Um, I think it's available online. So Charts tells the whole story of, of what happened there. And you were like in your 30s at the yes, time. Yes, I was, I was in my 30s, yeah. Wow, yeah. that's incredible. So then you come back and what happens next? So I come back um, and in kind of preparing for going to present the case, because. Normally, you know, there'd be lawyers to go and present the case. I had to go there, you know, I was a complainant. I had to read and study and find out about disinformation. And so from that, I kind of developed a real deep passion for kind of tackling uh, disinformation and platform accountability and kind of learning um, and experiencing firsthand what the dangers are when social media platforms don't act on disinformation. So it became a really big passion of mine. Um, I kind of introduced in South Africa in Parliament for the first time a lot of focus on big tech and holding big tech accountable. Um, so I kind of developed a voice where I was kind of, a, a, my, my work as a young female MP from South Africa, where I, my, my work meant that I could get onto an, a global stage um, and kind of enter into discussions with people on a global level doing that kind of work. So, yeah. Mm, incredible. <laughs> yeah. So you were part of, I know, a recent study that came out, um, fabulous study, She Persisted. And it looked at violence against women in politics, but online violence, mm. right? Um, and I know that one of the, the things that the study finds is that women political leaders are twice as likely to face online threats, harassment, violence, um, you know, disinformation campaigns, mm -hmm. like gendered, misogynistic, you know, disinformation campaigns. Have you found that to be true? And what has it done in terms of leaders in politics. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think after the Bill Pottinger saga, I think about a year later, I suddenly had, I was under heavy attack on social media. So there were bot campaigns and I just didn't understand it. Um, and, you know, I've been kind of thinking a lot lately about being a woman leader um, and what that means and being online and kind of having to go into that space and kind of girding your loins and like, I'm gonna go online now and you know, there'll be rape threats, there'll be tropes, there'll be memes, I'll be sexualized. Um, and it is incredibly difficult. Um, and I remember in my party, basically most of the women kind of gave their social media accounts to staff or they just deleted their accounts altogether. And what that does, it means that women leaders don't have the benefit that a social media account provides you because it gives you an opportunity to kind of speak directly to the electorate, to build relationships where people can get a sense of who you are. So that's the one thing that it silences women's voices. And I think one of the biggest disadvantages is that, you know, Vital Voices kind of invests in women leaders. Um, and I think our role is to kind of make it easier for the women who come behind us. And I think a lot of young women see this. 
uh, online and they see the amount of hatred that women are sub women leaders are subjected to that they're just like I, I'm, I'm not interested in this I don't want to be part of this or their children yeah obviously. or their children yeah and they're like I don't want to be part of this so it means that there's less women involved you know in positions of, of power because they just I, mm. I, I don't want to put up with this mm. You know, we look quite a bit at the progress that's been made for women, women leaders, but women's rights more broadly yeah. over the last 25 years since we were 25 years old now as a, as a nonprofit. And what we've seen is this steady rise of women getting into positions of power and leadership, political um, positions. And all of a sudden, in the last couple of years, there's been a dip, a drop. So it is sad. directly linked to violence, threats, polarization, and not just in this country. In this country, it's true as well. If you look at um, the numbers of women, candidates, just candidates, not who won, but candidates in uh, 2020 elections versus today, it's lower, yeah. considerably lower. So tell me a little bit about um, your experience and why you decided to leave um, political office. Yeah. Um It's, it's incredibly tough um, and it can be incredibly lonely um, because you have to spend a lot of time fighting. Um, you know, you break the ceiling, you're there, and I got into politics, 31, with bright tight and bush tails, like, Wah. go in there. Work hard, and I worked really hard, and I was effective in my work. But it was only when I started to do well that I was under heavy attack, and I didn't understand it. So it meant that I had to spend a lot of time fighting just for being able to do my work, and it was not ever anything that had to do with my effectiveness. Um, I was under attack because I was effective, and I kind of. Um, yeah, it's a bit, a bit difficult to talk about. Uh, yeah, I think I'm still going through kind of the, the trauma of it because I think that's the one thing we don't really kind of discuss as women leaders is just how damaging that kind of that kind of thing is. Um, you know, we tell women be strong. Be, yeah. It's great, and I'm there, and I'm strong. But sometimes. You get tired of being strong. It's like, I just want to do my work. I want a life of ease. And it got to a point for me when I decided to leave. It was an incredibly difficult decision to make where it got to a point where I was kind of being forced to compromise on my values. And it had to do with Facebook and holding Facebook accountable. And my party kind of wanted me to keep quiet and just leave Facebook alone, and I wouldn't. Um, so for me, it came leaving politics was a point where I refused to compromise my beliefs. And I remember someone said to me, but should you just not have kept quiet um, and just stayed on and been there and continued to fight? And I think it was far more powerful for me to leave because it sent the message out that this is what happens when you don't treat women leaders right. They leave. Um, and my leaving was a big event for my, for my party. And I think they did, didn't do as well in the elections mm. because of that saga. So yeah, it's incredibly difficult. Um, and it's great that org organizations such as Vital Voices exist um, because it's can feel so lonely when you're fighting and people don't understand because they're like, just keep quiet, just do your job, don't cause trouble, don't make waves, things will be fine. And if you're not that kind of person, it's, it's incredibly difficult. So it's good to be part of a group of women that are doing the same thing and you have that support and you know that you're not alone. Um, yeah. One of, um, one of uh, uh, another woman in our network from Mexico, a businesswoman who, you know, spoke out and uh, government didn't like that and uh, they put her on a list of enemies of the state, you know, and so she had to leave, take her family, went to Miami. I mean, 
it is really becoming, um, it seems as though, I'll just say, you know, w many of us probably have seen the news that, you know, COVID, the climate crisis, and, you know, general crisis from Afghanistan to Iran to Ukraine disproportionately negatively impacts women. But what we also see as women gain more power and more voice, there is a rising tide of those who want to mm. silence women, control women. And you know, you think about Iran, what's happening in Iran is happening here in the United States, it's happening in South Africa, it's happening online, and what it is, it's about self-determination. Women wanting to control their own bodies, their reputation, their careers, their future, whether or not they get to get educated, whether or not they have to be married, and someone else saying, no, these restrictions are put on you. I mean, you think about like what's happening in Iran and how, you know, they could be marching to, to their grave, you know? I mean, the, the violence is just ramping up and it hasn't even begun to get started, right? Um, but they do it because they feel we have nothing to lose. Um, and that is, not, that is not a good state to be in. No. <laughs> um, so I want to um, switch gears a little bit, not really switch gears, but just talk about you left and then started the first electoral disinformation project, monitoring and, and really looking at um, the challenges there. What did you find, and obviously I can imagine, that obviously was met with difficulty, I'm sure, as no, well. Absolutely. So after I resigned, I founded uh, and coordinated South Africa's first electoral disinformation monitoring project, which was kind of based on understanding kind of the different communities online and what they believe and why they believe that. Um, and what, I, what I've found, because I've tried to kind of look at the landscape and what it means for women and why women are under attack, why there's a regression uh, I think Roe v. Wade is a great example of how there's a regression. I think it's very shocking. It's like, how are things going backwards? We fought so hard. Why is there a regression? And from the work that I've done and the research done in the industry is that there is a concerted effort online to take away women's rights. Um, and there's groups that exist. I think Andrew Tate, I think everyone knows Andrew Tate. Um, so there's a big community of people like Andrew Tate online. Um, I think he was just, is, is a tiny symptom of the problem. Um, the, uh, YouTube channels, you know, they have existed for a very long time of people who are spreading the ideology that women are less than, um, you know, hate women, women are terrible. And I think from those groupings, what it's done is that it hasn't stayed online, it's gone into real life, where there is, where it can go so far as a country deciding that to take away a reproductive rights. Um, and it kind of starts online. Um, where people are radicalized, and it's just, it's even beyond just like harmful beliefs. It results in real life violence, and we, as we have seen, it re results in societal changes. It harms social fabrics. Um, so I think what is happening online, um, it's really just having an effect on, on women's rights, and it's making it much harder to be a woman. And I, I don't even think it's all over the world. Um, and I think there needs to be a lot of, we need to continue pushing social media platforms to act against these groupings. Um, and, I, and there needs to be a critical mass of people, and it's not something we can kind of leave to regulators or governments alone. It's important for advertisers, to push advertisers to say, if there is not proper content moderation on Facebook, uh, advertisers must walk. Um, I saw today Elon Musk said uh, Twitter's revenue tanked because um, he said these activists um, have been kicking up a stink and, and advertisers were walking, so there was a dip in Twitter's revenue. So I think it's really important for all of us um, to take a stand and say we will not allow for groupings to exist online who is, whose specific 
purpose is to take away his women's rights. Um, so it's important for all of us to play. A, you, you might think it's a really small action, but it, it, it all kind of helps towards the greater goal. And hopefully we can undo the grave damage. It's incredibly frightening that there's regression. So I want to, yes, I know, right? Amazing. Um, I find it also so extraordinary how, you know, you have basically taken your experience. I mean, to me, this is the mark of a leader, right? You take your experience and, you know, face it every day, even how difficult it is, the, as you say, the trauma of it, so that you can change the system and people just don't have to go through it anymore. Um, and it is really interesting because, I mean, I, I, I'm sure all of us think about this coming up on election and, and just looking at what's going on around the world, Russia, you know, invading and attacking Ukraine unprovoked, and the rise of authoritarian regimes, obviously we, you know, it's very scary, but what's really interesting, the anecdote against them is women leaders, okay? Now, there is real data on this that basically says that democratic movements against authoritarian regimes that have, need to have at least 25% of women in leadership positions in order to topple that regime, okay? That is critical. Without that, it just looks like angry men in the streets. But when women are part of it in leadership positions, they bring their mothers, they have to bring their children because maybe they don't have childcare, right? And all of a sudden, it normalizes it. It seems like, oh, everybody cares about this. Look at the kids and the grannies in the street, you know? So, and, and you know, they bring their friends, they, they, they bring people together, you know, in a way where, you know, finding the connection across the commonalities. And then all of a sudden, things begin to shift. Um, and, and, you know, we've seen that in so many places around the world. And so one of the things that, you know, I am fixated on is really looking at if we want to solve so many of these challenges, not just, you know, the, you know, the economy and climate and all of these things that women are certainly really critical in, in, in solving, but if we want to solve this issue of the rise of authoritarian regimes, women leaders are critical. And so we all have a vested interest in making sure that their voices can be heard, that they can be in leadership positions, that they are safe in politics, right? I mean, it is not acceptable that, you know, we would not want our daughters to go into politics because it's just too dangerous, right? Um, so I want to just reach out if there are any questions or comments before we close. I know we're coming up on dinner. Yes, question back there. Hi. Hi. I just wanted to say thank you for this. I really, this is really inspiring for me. I'm a sophomore at Emerson College currently, and I'm struggling to find my place in politics exactly, but hearing both of you speak, this is exactly what I want to do. It kind of clicked for me. This is exactly what I want to do, get involved in Vital Voices in some sort of misinformation panel. How does someone like me get involved in something like that? Well, I think, I mean, one thing I'd say, uh, I, I interned, 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 right? You want to get as much experience in it as you can. Um, and I think also sort of what is your, you know, your niche as your generation, right? I mean, you could, I, I'm sure, bring a lot um, to political candidates, um, you know, whether it's interning on Capitol Hill, but also working at tech companies that, you know, are trying to be responsible so, I mean, I think that's what I would say is get as much experience out there as you can. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I started out as a political staffer. I was a researcher and communications officer. And I did a lot of activism to kind of build my, my experience in politics. But I, I, I'd say go for it. Um, claim your space. Go out there and... You're deserving, and it's really inspirational for me to see a young woman saying, "I actually want to do this." Because most, of, most, I think young people have become very kind of apathetic, and they have no interest in politics, and and are kind of finding different ways to express themselves politically outside of politics. So I, I would absolutely encourage you to do it. Um, work hard. Don't give up. Keep knocking on doors. Break the door down if you must. 
um, if it's closed, yeah, back pick it door. down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, absolutely, go for it, work hard. I mean, find creative ways to just get your political message out there. Use social media, use TikTok, um, just to get yourself and your message out there. Um, I'm, I'm, I really, yeah, I fully encourage you and I fully support you. And we'll see you in Congress in a few years. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Um, so I'm a journalist, and I think doxing and harassment is also very much an issue that journalists, especially women journalists, face um, on social media and online. Um, and I think you know what you said about walking away was really powerful, um, and it's you know great that you talked about prioritizing your own emotional needs, especially when women are so often told our you know, emotions are a hindrance. So <laughs> um, but I also wonder when in this polarized space, so many of the people doing that online harassment are doing it with the intention to push you out. Um, and it's awesome to hear that it ended up you know, having an impact, the decision to leave, and people took notice and realized it. Um, but I just wonder about when people are intentionally trying to push you out like how to how to balance still maintaining space in such a hostile, brutal environment, um, but not you know letting them quote unquote win, I guess yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah. So are you talking about social media and kind of having a social media presence? Um, I just mean I mean when you're facing harassment, like how to keep you know doing the work that you're doing without getting pushed out. Um, I'm not. I'm tr not trying to say you were pushed out by any no, means. No, like no. your choice was empowering, but I feel like, in, especially with like journalists, people are trying to shut down like young female journalists yeah. from I think, reporting. Um, on social media, um, I think there's a there's a woman journalist in South Africa, and she's subjected to the most vile, vile hatred online. Um, and I kind of d don't like to share my formula for social media and how I just refuse to leave social media and I refuse to share my opinions. I just stayed and I said what I wanted to say. Um, and sometimes I had to fight back because that's kind of how you win. Um, because when you get a lot of hate on social media, you know, the natural responses to just, okay, I don't have to put up with this, I'm not going to do this. What I've done, I, and what I did during my career, I think I ended up being the only kind of politician in kind of my party who still ran my own social media account, is just stand firm, especially as a young woman, um, because they know those kind of things will kind of maybe want to get you to leave social media. I just stayed, and I say what I had to say, um, and sometimes I fought, but I found that by kind of doing that, um, it has greatly reduced the amounts of hate that I receive of people trying to kind of silence me because they realize that, you know, we can do whatever, bot attacks, we can, whatever we do, this woman's not going to leave. Um, it's sad to say this, but we have to fight. Um, and what I always say to myself, what kind of gives me comfort is knowing that there were women before me who had much bigger fights that make it, made it easier for me. And I think it's up to us as this generation to continue fighting, unfortunately. I wish it wasn't that way, so that the women who come behind us, um, things become easier for them. I wish there was a nicer, simpler answer than, man, you just gotta fight. It's exhausting, it is draining, um, fights, but also just remember you. Um, yeah. I think also, I mean, one of the, one of the techniques that we have seen from um, other women political leaders, and I realize you're talking about journalists, but I would imagine this would translate, leaders in society. Um, mm. is, is actually um, having a group of people that just drown out the negative with positive, right? I mean, you know, because, you know, you think about it, it's like, okay, that's one side, this is the other. Um, and I don't know if you saw, the, there was a great piece in the New York Times a couple weeks ago about 
how Russian bots went after the um, founders of the Women's March and tore it apart, tore them apart, right? And I think about, wow, turns out, you know, people did care about the Women's March and what they were saying, even though, you know, certain people said, oh, no, I don't care about those crazy women and da-da-da, right? But of course, yeah, I mean, and so I will say one thing is like, you know, you know, if nobody's listening, you're not getting attacked, right? But mm -hmm. if you are, I mean, clearly, you know, you're having an impact. Um, anyway, I hate yeah. to say this. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> terrible. I hate, that's why I just don't like telling women to be strong. It just seems like, just be strong, just go out there. It's, I really wish it wasn't that way, because it's just, why can't we just have lives of ease? Why can't you just go and be a journalist and write your stories and just do your job and, you know, be judged on that, but. Yeah. But also the, you know, yeah. what you're fighting for now, I think, with, with greater ethics mm -hmm. in the space, in the online space that is, you know, not governed, right? I mean, really. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I, I love what you said earlier about, you know, companies holding people to account, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and deciding, yeah, we're, we're, we're taking our money out of Twitter because we don't like this and where it's going. So, I mean, that is certainly power. Um, and so we have to be thinking about that. Okay, if the tech companies aren't going to change because they're making a lot of money, then we need to figure out, well, what are the other levers of power? And, you know, I mean, obviously consumers have mm -hmm. power. So you were going to ask a question. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, you spoke a lot about uh, kind of this rising wave of authoritarianism around the world. Um, and unfortunately, I think a lot of those spaces are women, too, right? You have Marie Le Pen, the new prime minister of Italy, and even in America here, you know, someone like Marjorie Taylor Greene. Right. Um, and, and I guess my question is, <laughs> <laughs> is you know, I, I, what do you say to that? And, and also, like, you know, how do you, as leaders, how do you approach someone from your own group, right, working against you? Whether that's on the lines of race or gender, or you know, even just the more community identity. Mm. Yeah. Well, I should have said there are exceptions to the rule. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a tough one, and I can tell you it is deeply disappointing. And I think, I mean, you know, it's, I mean, you know, it's, it's a little hard to speak because Vital Voices is bipartisan or nonpartisan, right? So we, we do try and be careful about that, which is why I don't name names as I was speaking earlier about the Women's March. <laughs> um, but I think that, um, you know, honestly, I think that one of the, the challenges is that the, the, the framework in which politics and government has existed for so long is about the sort of hierarchical strongman system, right? And I think until that system shifts, we are going to see that. I mean, you see women who are not leading from a more feminine style of leadership. And there are also men, quite frankly, who lead, in my opinion, in, in more of that way as well, right? Which is more collaborative, more inclusive, less hierarchical. It's not about male, female. It's about masculine, feminine, right? And, you know, for example, I thought Barack Obama actually had a lot of those traits. And, you know, I was, I was mentioning this to someone who's an expert in politics, and she's like, well, exactly, because, you know, he has spent his whole life sitting at tables where he's the O and everybody else is the X, right? Like, he's infiltrated these places. And, you know, when you are that person, you have to figure out how to be empathetic, how to put yourself in someone else's shoes, how to, you know, how to build bridges, how to find commonalities, right? How to put ego aside. And he was quite good at that, right? And I think that is where I have seen that women leaders bring a different perspective and I think have been able to to bring about greater change as leaders. But um, I think that, you know, we're still operating in an old framework that does, I think, reward, you know, um, hierarchical systems and, and, you know, yeah, you're going to get a lot of media attention when you come out, you know, <laughs> slightly crazy, right? Um, you know, I mean, there is there is space there, and, and clearly there are people who are claiming and taking that space, and it's, it's unfortunate. It really is. Um, I don't know if you had anything to add to that, but it's, I mean, it's a, it's a very good point. <laughs> I can't stand her. I don't have to be partisan. I think she's awful. <laughs> Terrible. Yeah. 
Um, I know that we are at the end of our time, but um, I want to just leave on a positive note. Yes. Um, and you know, one of the things that we talk a lot about is um, this idea of being a space invader, right? That there are spaces and tables that maybe weren't built for all of us, um, but how do we build our own? How do we build our own spaces as well as invade? Um, in a good way, take up the space. We, Vital Voices, for example, we um, just opened up a couple months ago um, the first ever global embassy for women leaders because we really felt like, great that we're out in the streets, but we need to take up space every single day and have presence um, and permanence. And we're right on 16th Street, a few blocks from the White House. You can see the White House from our roof and the Washington Monument. It is like taking up space, right? Um, because we wanted to both be in that space, but also have a space and a place of our own where we can show a different style of leadership. Um, but I want to hear how you feel like we need to be doing that, taking up that space. Um, I think there's women out there, there's lots of women taking up space, but I think women need support. I think young women who want to enter politics, they, you know, you need to have a community of not just women, but also men kind of helping you succeed. Um, I really would just love to see a greater movement of men and women uh, taking up space to say we will not allow for a regression on gender rights. Um, ultimately, the people are far more powerful than politicians and the people in power. And I would like to see everyone become an activist in their own right. Um, I think everyone kind of has the power to bring about change. And I think a lot of people are kind of disillusioned because things are going backwards, things are terrible, what can I do, I can't do anything. And I would really encourage everyone to do, even if it's posting on social media, and it seems like nothing if it's going to join a march, joining a women's march, um, attending a meeting, I would really just encourage everyone, men, women, young, old, different races, to just get behind getting, building a world that is kinder and fairer for women. Um, I'd really like just encourage everyone to be involved in that. Um, it's not a fight for women alone. Uh, men need to be right there alongside us um, fighting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prince Thank you all for having us.